a miracle drug is on the market, but could it be used to control the human population? And then we travel back to the year 1923 to visit a log cabin. It's been long abandoned, holding nothing but a skeleton and torment from beyond the grave. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. Hope you guys are having a great day too. I'm drenched in sweat. Yes, it's if you've been listening since episode one, it's summertime and I'm recording with no fans on. We're also taking a break from Alien Disclosure Week as well, but we will finish it up tomorrow with the New York Times. We're going to take a look at those New York Times articles about UFO Disclosure. Very, very weird information in there that not a lot of people are noticing or at least talking about. Let's go ahead and give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Mop Queen Mab. Why Mop, thank you so much for supporting the show. Really, really helps out a lot. She actually recommended a story to me today about Jack Parsons. It's funny, I've I've read about Jack Parsons a lot. I don't really think I've mentioned him on the show. He was the guy who was a big part of JPL, big part of early American rocket technology, and a super weirdo occultist dude who used to run around with L. Ron Hubbard, and I think it was banging his wife, or L. Ron Hubbard was banging Jack Parsons' wife or something like that. And um, so, yeah, if I can find a really cool, because I've read a lot about him. If I can find a cool new angle to really talk about, and she kind of led me on to want to look into it, uh, we may end up uh, talking about Jack Parsons if you're familiar with that. I'm looking for a new angle on it, though. That all being said, Queen Mob, thank you so much for supporting the show. You're going to be our person behind the cockpit pilots, what they normally called. And if you can't support the Patreon, that's okay, too. Just help get the word out about the show. Talk about it online. Talk about it to your friends. That also really, really helps out a lot. So, Queen Mab, let's hop in the Jason Jalopy. We're going to go for a little drive. First off, we're going to drive to a local hospital. A local hospital, and it's bustling with activity. We walk in. There's people sitting around with, like, broken legs. You know, it's like something you'd see in, like, an episode of ER. There's, like, a guy with his arm in a sling. And then, I guess, people dying because it's a hospital. And the baby's being born. So, you know, the universe balances out. But we're here for a specific reason. This guy is being brought in by authorities. And they're like, hey, we got a call. This guy is wants to kill himself. This guy is trying to kill himself. So we're like, oh, that's that's weird. (laughs) That's weird that they said that out loud and we can identify this guy. But we follow Queen Mab, myself, and you are also welcome. HIPAA laws be damned. We walk into this guy's room. This guy is completely despondent. He's going to kill himself. And the doctor goes, hmm, I have the thing right here. It will cure your illness. And he pulls out a little nasal spray bottle. And he sticks it up the guy's nose. And he goes, psst, psst. And then he puts it in the other nostril. Psst, psst. Gives him two sprays. And the guy goes, whoa, dude. Whoa, what? I totally don't want to kill myself now. Doc, that's amazing. Doctor's like, you, you, this, this isn't the end. Like, you need to do therapy. We need to look at some other stuff. But it is amazing. And the doctor holds out this little inhaler for us to see. This stuff is real. It's not only this is okay. So here's the thing: we always hear about, like, Elon Musk just talked about putting a chip in people's brains so they can control their mood. That's like a theoretical thing they're working on. What I just described to you is real. Not only is it real. It's in use today. It's from Johnson & Johnson's. It's called Spravato. And it is a nasal, it's a incredibly rapid-release antidepressant. Most antidepressants take a couple weeks to build up. But this stuff, pss, pss, it's a rapid, I mean, it's that's faster than fast. They're like, get out of the way, fast-acting antidepressant. I'm a rapid antidepressant. Spravato. They came up with it back in the 90s, but back in March 2019, the FDA said, we approve this. You can actually use this on people. Trump's really wanted it to be in use at uh, VA hospitals. We have a horrible suicide epidemic with our veterans here in the United States. It's absolutely tragic. It's heartbreaking. And when, when the history books are written about the COVID crisis, long after everything has settled down, I think one of the things we're going to see is is accurate suicide statistics. I think I think no one's really reporting those yet. Maybe we don't have the the numbers to really match them, but even before COVID, we were seeing suicide rate going up 30% in like the past 10 years. 
in the article from Medical Express that was written about this, this was, uh, the article was, Nasal Spray Approved for Treating Suicidal People. This was written by Cynthia Coons. It specifically said, because COVID-19 has caused a massive increase in depression. I think when we're really honest about the COVID crisis and the, and the pr- cost of everything that's been going on, we're going to find just massive suicide rates, which is tragic. So, Spravato, they really want to start using this stuff now. Uh, since March, 6,000 people, since March of 2019, 6,000 people have been treated with this. You're suicidal. They sprayed up your nose. You're not suicidal. Uh, right now, at least, right? Like, it can be a long-term thing that you're dealing with depression and, and things like that. So I read that and I thought, that's amazing. But then the little conspiracy theorist thing popped up in my head. As a drug, this is great. Possible short-term cure for a very serious illness. But then I thought, hmm, the stroke of my little beard. Queen Mab, let's hop back in that Jason Jalopy. We're going to travel to the year 2025. We're at that same hospital. But now it looks like something out of New Detroit. It's straight up Robocop. There's like graffiti on the top floor. We're like, how did they do that? How did they get way up there? There's a bunch of punks. They're like, what? Yeah, they have like the green mohawks with the spikes and stuff like that. And their spikes have spikes. It's the craziest thing. Genetic, genetically modified hair in the year 2025. We see people being dragged forcibly into the hospital by the police. And the police are like, what? You don't, you don't you follow whatever laws we're talking about. It's the year 2025. You don't eat yogurt on Sundays. And the guy's like, no, it's disgusting. I never eat yogurt. And they're like, uh uh-huh. And you see the doctor, but now he's wearing a black leather medical coat. He's all evil looking, and he pulls out a little black colored nasal spray, and he puts it up your nose, and you're like, no, no, I'll never eat yogurt. (laughs) Oh, whatever you say, master. Whatever you say, apparently now you just become a goon. This is what I was thinking. It's a fast-releasing antidepressant. But what happened, conspiracy cap fully on, to cover up our spiked mohawk, conspiracy cap fully on, what would stop the government from being like, you're a dissident, you're not following what the government does, we're going to spray this up your nose. Is that, is is that alarmist? Is that alarmist? It would work though, like let's say you were out like protesting against the government, and they're like, "Mm -mm mm-mm-mm, they have just, (laughs) they have a giant cannon that's in the shape of a nasal spray bottle, two cops have to jump up and down on it, it's all psh, 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 into the crowd, they're like, ah, and then they're just peaceful. To put a chip in someone's brain, like that's really hard to do against your will, right? You're like, no, no, you'll never take me alive, and then like in the ambulance, what? No way! And then they're dragging you in the operating room, ah, and then they're putting the oxygen mask on you, like slapping it away. It would take hours to do, right? Or they could just come to your house and spray you in the nose with it. Or my idea where they're jumping up and down on it, entire neighborhoods get fumigated. Fast-acting antidepressant. It's great for people who need it. But what's to stop? What's to stop the brutal totalitarians of the year 2025 from using it against us as a weapon of war? So let me explain a little bit about what this is. <laughs> this far into the segment, people are like, what is this madness he's talking about? There's no magical stuff. It's ketamine. Technically, it's a cousin or a relative to ketamine. It's maybe like a sister-in-law to ketamine. But it's a drug people now use just to get blotto, right? They want to go to the K-hole. It's horse tranquilizer, but for your nose. And you go, and it basically gets you high. You get instantly sedated, and you just kind of just want to go with the flow, man. You just want to eat pancakes. It's that. And it's very expensive. It starts at $4,700 a month. You get a little spray bottle of it. In Britain, they've already said it's too expensive. If you're currently using it with your doctor's permission, we'll pay for it, but we're not allowing anyone else to use it. In America, they want to make it more open than that. But So that's what I should have explained that all earlier. What's interesting is when I was reading this article, I came across this sentence after I had already imagined my RoboCop-esque future with a bunch of like robots dragging us out of our houses. They're spraying ketamine right in our faces. Ah, ah. They go to the Kentucky Derby. Psh, the horses are all falling asleep, but one of them's wearing a gas mask. They're like, good old Gassy wins again. Everyone's like, oh, why do we always bet against Gassy? I know the robots are going to show up. After I had already <laughs> imagined that future, when I was rereading the article, I came across this sentence. In its studies, Johnson & Johnson found those who got the drug had a rapid reduction in the severity of their thinking. Although 
The results didn't differ in a statistically significant way from patients given a placebo. That's an interesting little thing. I, it's not saying that it doesn't work. It's saying that if you walked up to someone and just sprayed them with a nasal spray that just had water in it, it would also statistically have a chance of snapping them out of whatever deep despair they're in at that moment. Again, it's su- suicide ideation is, is a long-term thing, and wanting to kill yourself is a long-term thing. Therapy has to be included in this. But this obviously helps in some fashion. They have made it available. However, we must keep it out of the hands of the Robocops of the world. Because once Elon Musk invents those, psst, psst, it's the last thing you'll hear. We've always been afraid of the New World Order. You never knew you were supposed to be afraid of the no- <laughs> of the nose world order. Huh? Huh? Bet you didn't sm- smell that one coming. Queen Mab, <laughs> before I tell any more puns. Queen Mab, let's go ahead and hop in that carpenter copter. We're leaving behind the futuristic hellscape of 2025. They're trying to shoot mist at us. But luckily, the wind is at our fronts. Is that the good thing? That means it's blowing it away from us. The Robocops are like... <laughs> Probably shouldn't have built nose receptors in me. (laughs) We're flying away. We're going back to old-timey Nevada. Old-timey Eureka, Nevada, to be precise. It's the year 1871. This was actually a request from Kent Allard. So, Kent, thank you so much for this story. It's, It's a great story. He sent this to me. He also sent me another story that it's going to take me a long time to do, but um, it's one that I had lost. It was a story that I had lot long before I was doing the podcast, probably back in 2011, 2012, I read this amazing story online. I don't even know how I'm going to present it to you. I thought it was gone forever because you know how the internet can be. But no, he found it. So hats off to you with that too, Ken Allard. We're flying low over the Nevada desert. Look out for that canyon. And there's a little wood cabin just standing there. Been all deserted and stuff. Wind. Sand. Sand doesn't make a noise, so I had no sound effect for that. But we're walking across the sand. And we walk into this cabin. And there's a pirate in there. Arr, matey. It's time for me to leave. And he leaves. And we're like, okay. And we also see, the pirate didn't happen, but we also see a skeleton just sitting there. Technically, skeletons wouldn't sit there, right? It would just be like a pile of bones. Maybe the skull's on the table and like the rib cage is in the chair and then there's just a bunch of random bones sitting on the ground. But you get the point, right? Even if you just saw a skull, you would be like, well, where's the rest of the bones? You understand it's a dead human. We're walking around this log cabin and you lean against it. You know, after a long day of meeting a pirate in a room full of a skeleton, you kind of lean against the wall. Ah, this is exactly how I expected my Thursday to be. And you feel something kind of like nudge against your elbow. You're like, well, that's weird. And you turn around and you see a piece of paper pushed into the space between the logs. This is actually a real letter that was found in a log cabin in Eureka, Nevada. This was published in a newspaper called the Crisfield Times. It was in the August 18th, 1923 edition. This is compiled from a book called History of Crisfield and Surrounding Areas of Maryland's Eastern Shore. This is a newspaper in Crisfield. Maryland. So we start reading this letter. We sit down all together. We're reading this letter. After four years of wandering, I am back in the cabin which I built six years ago. Surely those six years of hell should go toward the final reckoning. That's a way to start a letter, right? Like that gets your attention right there. There's a skeleton in a room. There's a letter in the wall. That right there. Life sucks, but maybe it's a down payment on the damnation that is awaiting me. Dude. Unfortunately, this guy is not an author. He's a pile of bones, but we'll find out why he's a pile of bones. He continues with the letter with this. I wonder if anyone will ever read this, or will it rot beside me? It seems that I could lie down easier if I write out that which I could not dare to whisper, since I did it. He goes on to say that his name is Les Singleton, so he turn to the skeleton and go, Hi, Les! His name is Les Singleton. He was born in Crisfield, Maryland. That's why they're reporting it in that newspaper. He enlisted in the Confederacy and suffered two wounds during the war, and then eventually his parents died. Confederacy lost the war, and he was turning, (laughs) looking around the burning remnants of Maryland, and he goes, "Eh." So he goes to Nevada. He ends up in Eureka in the year 1871. And he gets a job as a feeder 
at a furnace in Richmond. So a feeder, despite if you Google feeder today, which is uh, someone who feeds another human until they become immobile and then feeds them more. It's that's one of the worst fetishes. Okay, that's not true. There's a lot worse, but that one's bad. So, but basically, it's already been burned in my head. So, as I'm reading this article, I just imagine this man throwing cheeseburgers into an 800 pound person's mouth. But that's not what he's doing because that fetish wasn't around back then. They didn't have enough food to have that. He is a feeder at a furnace in Richmond, and he's sitting there. He's throwing coal with a shovel. Oh, he makes that he makes that noise for eight hours a day, throwing it into the furnace, the fire, burning it up. He's like, "This isn't a bad job. It's just making me awfully hungry for a cheeseburger." The big boilers looks like a giant fat dude. It's like someday people will pay money to watch me do this. So, anyways, while he's imagining the future of the internet, his coworker John Murphy is a total jerk to him. Constantly, like, berating him, pushing him around, which is not something you... It's bad enough to have a workplace bully, but when you're near a giant furnace, that's not especially where you don't want someone to pull pranks. They're, like, dropping hot coals down your overalls. You're like, ow, ow, ow! And it's like, sounds funny, but really, you're suffering third-degree burns on your spine. Ah! Guy's constantly picking on him, though. John Murphy's constantly picking on Les Singleton. And then one day, it escalates to physical violence. John actually slaps Les Singleton, and Les Singleton falls to the ground. He's like, (sighs) which would I imagine is super hot. He falls hands first right into the coals. Ah! Ah, I should should get up a little bit faster than I am, but I'm going to get up slowly so I can contemplate my revenge. Because at this point, he says, quote, Murphy signed his death warrant then and there. So his letter, he's detailing all this stuff. The second that hands were laid on him, he's like, I was going to kill this dude. There was no, this dude was not walking away from this. But the thing is, is that John Murphy could tell that he finally pushed Lil Les Singleton too far. Les did nothing. And John Murphy starts going, dude, what are you going to do, man? Like, I just pushed you. Look at your, your hands. Look at your hands. They're all smoldering, little like smokes coming out of them. Cartoon smoke lines are coming out of your hands right now, bro. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, man? Huh? What are you going to do? And Les Singleton just is staring at him. Here's another quote from his letter. He taunted me for being a coward, and I restrained myself with the greatest difficulty, consoling myself with thoughts of the terrible revenge I would wreak upon him. The idea struck me it would be an easy matter to strike him on the head and throw his body into the furnace. Detection would be impossible. So imagine now Les Singleton is staring at John Murphy, right? And he's imagining that speech in his head. But in real life, it's just John Murphy going, He taunted me for being (laughs) a coward. And I restrained myself with the greatest difficulty. Consoling myself with (laughs) thoughts of the terrible (laughs) revenge. Look at this big old wimp. Oh, wait, we're the only two employees. The idea struck me. Doesn't matter. I'm going to invent a telephone and call people. Strike him on the head. And tell him to come out here to laugh at you. I can just imagine those two things like happening at once. You had that inner monologue. He's just seething. Steam's coming out of his ears. Steam's coming off of his hands. And then just this dude pointing and laughing. Two weeks later, though, Les has his chance. He looks around. Huh? Huh? And he bonk, hits him on the back of the head with a shovel so hard that it kills him. Now, I can... Knowing modern science, it probably didn't kill him, which makes the next thing even more gruesome. It probably knocked him out. You would, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe modern shovels you get at Home Depot are a lot lighter than the shovels they had. Back in 1871, your grandpa's like, what? These shovels today suck. Back in my day, a shovel weighed 1,000 pounds. Probably knocked him unconscious. Probably didn't kill him, though. So when he picks up John Murphy's body and throws him into the furnace, there's a pretty good chance that he was still alive when his body began to burn in the fire. Let's go back to this letter here. I really love the letter. I love, because I love the way that he's describing everything. I love manifestos to begin with. I kind of collect them. I love the language that he uses. That's why I'm really referencing this letter a lot. But, quote, The next day was truly hell. It seemed as if every shovelful I flung into the feed hole of the furnace struck on Murphy's body, and the bubbling of the blast took itself a speech and upbraided me. 
for my wickedness. When barring out time came, I tried looking that up. I don't know what that means. I'm imagining that's when you're like pulling out the stuff you've been smelting based on the context of this next sentence. But when barring out time came, it seemed I was raking human bones instead of clinkers of iron. Hallucination fixed itself upon my brain and I saw Murphy materialize at every part of the furnace. I got such a mania for looking into the feed hole that I soon became incapacitated for further work. Then, I built this cabin and went into the charcoal burning business. That's the last part's not a joke. <laughs> that actually happened. If I was being tormented by the flames, if I burned a man alive or dead, it doesn't matter, if I killed a man and hit his body in the flames, and every time I'm doing something flame-related, I see him out of the corner of my eye, lighting a cigarette, there's a little tiny John on the match head shaking his finger at me. I would not be like, oh man, I'm having such horrible visions at the feeder feeder factory or wherever I work. All those flames, they remind me of that man I murdered. I'm going to go get a job at another flame-related place. I'm going to go get a job at a crematory. Not, not a good idea. He could have done something else. But anyways, that doesn't, that doesn't end up working out, obviously, right? He ends up kind of wandering around. He says he goes back east, which I'm assuming he ends up back at Crisfield, Maryland, which is where he's from. So he says this, I went back east where I wandered for four years. But no matter where I went, I saw Murphy just before my eyes, sitting in a white hot blast, taunting me. I came back to Eureka and paid the furnace a visit. That's where you want to go, right? Like, oh man, those good old days, you're all nostalgic for that time you murdered a man. You're like, oh dude, it was so fun growing up, listening to that 90s music, that 1890s music. Oh, so great. They had the back country boys. Oh, that. <laughs> Brittany musket <laughs> doesn't even make well you know like spears is a weapon musket's a weapon uh, let's see if I can come up with anyone anything else Fiona Appleseed <laughs> it's like Johnny Appleseed <laughs> does, that, does that even make sense no give me one more give me one more let me think the moment's gone the moment's gone okay so anyways Maybe maybe you <laughs> email me your your nineties eighteen nineties band. What, what are we even talking about? We're talking about a man who's murdered someone. Anyways, he's nostalgic for the good old days, the good old days of that time he murdered his bully. I came back to Eureka. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of nineties. I came back to Eureka and paid the furnace a visit. Although it was shut down, I saw Murphy there, grinning at me. I could feel my reason slipping, so I went to town and bought some laudanum, which is basically morphine. It was super, super potent morphine. It was a tincture. Two, two to three teaspoons would kill you. Is a deadly dose, and it came in a little bottle of it. And they'd be like, we trust you. We trust you with this hardcore medicine that you're not going to use it to commit suicide. A lot of people in the 19th century used it. I imagine it would just put you to sleep. But anyway, I actually didn't plan that. That's interesting. We started off with suicide prevention, and now this dude's killing himself. So he has this little bottle. He's sitting in the cabin where we're at, where we're going to be in the future. He's sitting there, and he's finishing out this letter. As soon as I finish writing, I will take the poison and lay down in the bunk. Wait a second. Then why was a skeleton? <laughs> actually, I guess I made that detail up. I don't think a skeleton was sitting <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine a skeleton was sitting at a table writing a letter. That wouldn't be the most comfortable place to kill yourself, right? You're like, hmm, I'm gonna take this poison that's gonna put me to sleep till I die. I wanna get it. I wanna sit up. I'm gonna totally like. I'm gonna go running a marathon until I fall over. Like that would make sense. I guess I should finish reading this. Story. I mean, I did finish reading it, but for whatever reason, I just imagined like when they said they found a skeleton. I guess I always imagined that my skeleton would be sitting down. I sit way more than I, like, sleep, right? I always just imagined, like, a skeleton was sitting in the chair. That's why I had that whole thing at the beginning about how a skeleton is just sitting there. Anyways, oh, then you would see a whole skeleton if it was in the bed. So, moral of the story is (laughs) detail is important. Here we go. As soon as I finish writing on this table that I'm sitting at, Jason... I will take the poison and lay down in the bunk. I will lay here and rot and vermin will feast on me. I am sure I cannot go to a worse hell than I've been in for the last six years. 
So he took that letter, he wrote it out at his table, as people do, and then he got up, he stuffed it into the wall of his cabin, took the poison, laid down, and died. Now, this was, tell me if this isn't a spoiler headline. Like, that was a great story, right? It's kind of a great ghost story. It's a story of true crime, a story of revenge. This guy was just pushing him to the edge, pushing, 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 pushing. And the edge wasn't a metaphorical edge. It was literally the edge that would push him into a furnace. And he goes, hey, it's either you or me, buddy. But he couldn't live with the guilt. But this is the whole headline. This is the whole headline. Note its skeleton side reveals tale of murder, apparition, and suicide. That's not bad, right? Oh, I'm not finished. Confession is found in cabin after 40 years. Victim says he was born in Crisfield. Located in Nevada at close of Civil War, killed man and threw body in furnace, returned to cabin after years of wandering in East. It's like, why do I even have to read the article at that point? <laughs> Dude, you've told me everything. But I didn't want to read that to you in the beginning because obviously that spoils a lot of the stuff. What's interesting about the story is that, so this letter is found. It's then forwarded to the people of Crisfield, Maryland. And they report it in their newspaper, and they end up asking, they, they, you know, they want to know more about the story. When they send reporters out west to talk to people who lived in Eureka at the time, this was a documented event. People who had lived in Eureka, the old timers were sitting in their rocking chair, which was the height of technology back then. Look at this amazing chair! Elon Musk invented it! They're going back and forth, back and forth, and the reporter's like, that's an amazing story too! Man invents rocking chair. We'll get to that next week. But, do you remember anything about Les Singleton and John Murphy? And they talked to these people, all these old timers all over town, and no one in town knew either of those people. They knew about the furnace. They had heard about the story afterwards, but they go, no, we've never known of a Les Singleton or a John Murphy. Now, he said he lived there for years. People were like, nope. And it's a small town. Nobody ever knew anything about either of these guys. Which makes me think there's an even more tragic tale to this story. We don't know what wounds Les Singleton suffered fighting in the Civil War, but it's possible. Some of them were brain damage or mental damage, right? It's possible that John Murphy never existed. That Les Singleton never worked at the furnace. But he thought that he did. He thought that he was being berated by someone. He thought he was being pushed to the edge. And he thought he murdered somebody. And trapped in that mental delusion, he had created a reality in his own head that nobody else knew of. It just wasn't real. And he travels across the country, being haunted by the spirit of a man who never existed. And in the end, suffering from years of brain damage, he ends up in a cabin in the middle of Eureka. The cabin that he remembers building. But it's just an old abandoned cabin in the middle of nowhere. As he writes a letter, a ghost of a man that never existed sits across from him, smiling. You deserve what you get, Les. You deserve this. You deserve everything. In those last moments still haunting, Les, Les takes a swig of morphine, sets it down, puts the note in the wall, and dies. Fearful of burning in hell for sins that he never committed. Is this the story of a man who was so small in life that he could exist in a community for years and people just don't remember him? Or is it the story of a man who was driven mad by war, by unrelated killings, by unrelated strife, by unrelated depression? And as those thoughts built up in his mind, it created a reality of its own, one where he finally stood up against the bullies of the world and killed one. But in the end, even that imaginary sin was too much for Les Singleton to live with. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.